Hello, hello. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Hello, hello. Coming to us from the wonderful world of Diesel Shot, and previously he's been he had been on for his old project Aqua Diesel Age. Now coming back with the space opera affair known as Change Stars, the yep. one and only Leland Andercheck. Mm -hmm. How are you doing today, Hello. man? Great, good to be here. How are you doing, Mildred? I am. Do I am doing good. It's. Been I'm trying to remember how long it how long it's been since since that it thing that was it, well, it, three it, it years was, ago. I put it out in 2018, actually. So yeah, well, I guess we did talk about Ada a ways after I put it out. Yeah. Oh. But originally, I uh, I had planned mm -hmm. on originally I had planned on doing this during the Kickstarter, and congratulations on the successful yeah. release of the project. Um. So I I suppose I'll start with uh, where did where did the idea to jump into doing um doing a space opera come to and what would you say would be some of the me, some of the sci-fi media that would fit the appendix N for mm. change stars Oh that that'll be easy because inspiration we left it all on the floor in terms of there's a section in the beginning of the book that talks about that but um to answer the first part first um we're into sci-fi Pat's really into sci-fi I'm really into sci-fi I'm more into the psychic powers and sci-fan side of sci-fi but Pat who has a strong grounding like one of her degrees is in biology and she's an artist and she really likes to capture like these certain aesthetics um is more on the hard, hard sci-fi scientist side. And we were playing some alien RPG and some uh, Stars Without Number at the time, and we did, hadn't solidified that much in Stars, Stars Without Number, we were just doing whatever, although a species I made for a campaign that never happened in Swin is actually one of the kind of precursors in Change Stars. So yay, crossover. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we personally liked alien RPG, and we played like a year of it, and then some on our streamed channel on, on Diesel Shot, right? But uh, our, our offline gaming group that I've been with since college um, for many years at this point uh, just weren't that into Alien as a setting. Uh, they were fine with playing it, but they um, weren't really looking for it as a main jam. So Change Stars is sort of born of literally a poll in a group chat of like what's some things you'd like to see. And uh, we wound up massaging that into what eventually became the Change Stars setting and putting a lot of ourselves and our own interests into it mm. so the 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 pivot and it's interesting because in a sense right like the genre that we began with more was slightly the uh like the space horror stroke space thriller stroke planetary romance and then necessarily by the setting right and at like scaling the setting and making it we wind up with the space opera or at least the space opera potential right of change stars hmm. and that uh that's sort of the general journey as for our appendix n i mean page nine has inspirations right uh right off the bat uh the left hand of darkness by ursula k Le Guin, big influence on um how i like to think about the uniqueness of a planet in the setting and how lore can have a practical impact on the adventure um and like he's incillary justice was a big inspo for pat Altered Carbon by Richard K. Morgan. I'm more fan of the show than the books. There's some pretty heavy differences, but mm -hmm. good content either way. And the ideas of um, personhood in that with the stack system, for those of you who've never seen it, it's a cyberpunk world where you have more or less a mechanical thing jacked into you that is, like, it's a, it's a running brain backup. Mm -hmm. And you get into the eclipse phase scenario where what if it's been forked what if it's been tampered with what if you jack into a different body well moving through things in space is very difficult and expensive what if you you know just broadcast the data what happens to the data on the other side what happens to the body yada yada um 
Ooh, thank you. I've just been delivered a, a delicious meal. Thank you, Pat. Um, and the Alien franchise, obviously, Alien, Aliens, and Alien RPG itself, huge inspirations. Free League are great. Check them out. Check out those uh, movies. If you've never seen Outland as a film, which I hadn't until we didn't have until like just recently after Chain Stars came out, but my God, it could so easily be an adventure in Chain Stars or ARPG. Um, so films of the 80s, 70s, and 90s that had a hard sci-fi bent to them and were not really associated with a particular franchise, but just sort of a vague idea of what the future might be like, in addition to the Alien verse. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, if you want, if if any, I always I always joke that if anyone wants to see the origin point of Alien, then watch Dark Star. <laughs> mm. um, a lot of people. A lot of people weren't. A lot of people who would work on Alien ended up working on that movie, which itself was trying to be a parody of 2001. It's just that it's a parody that's in the that's in the same um, family as the as the works of Roger Corman and Dino De Laurentiis, who, yes, those two gave a lot of people their big break, but they're also notorious cheapskates. <laughs> mm. Oh man. yeah. Cameron has his own. Cameron has had his own stories about that, about how he his his directorial debut he couldn't actually be credited because of a because with Piranha Two there was some legal shenanigans where it, where it was required to have an Italian director, and oh, so when it came to trying to to get help in making term making Terminator, he had a situation where people were looking at him like he had, either has no experience or he has this one experience and it sucks because piranha 2 was a jo- was a jaws knockoff as one as one might expect from around that time <laughs> there's a there's much to be said about the italian cinema american cinema crossover with some of the older sci-fi like i'm trying to remember what the name of the film is but it's very like star voyage or something like very infamously schlocky film um, and like the, the guy says imperial battle destroyer stop time Battle Beyond the Stars. It is absolutely horrible, and I love it. It's so fucking funny. I've um, yeah, I love all of those. Uh, I, I mean, I we didn't get into them before Change Stars, so I can't say they're in, inspirations. But I will say that there is there's a lot of fun to be had in the genre, and we try and straddle that spectrum of like this isn't a constant dour situation. It's not a dystopia. Um, things are kind of looking up, mm-hmm. but it's, uh, and so there, there's, there's fun and there's lighthearted adventures and food wars shit to, I mean, we did like a food wars hack of our own game where it was just, they ran a threatened fusion restaurant mm-hmm. in the cultural ward of Ictus station and they were competing for this slot. And, um, you know, look, we've all, we've all been in those arguments about, about which state makes better barbecue. I've had to mediate some of those arguments, so it's not far, it's not that far off. Plus, that's really not. I've seen I've seen rivalries between between food between food stands both here and abroad. Some Escalate. Of those, some of those things can get nasty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's uh, it's just the joy of you know simple things like cooking or whatever, but in space and in this new context with this new setting. So I would say ultimately, we change stars inspirations that. Um, most recommend like enjoying as part of it the stuff that leans on the hard sci-fi stuff and stuff that leans on the lived in aspect with the stuff that's a little bit less um fantastical and heroic even if heroics happen but it's more about you know you see how they live you see where they live they get into the logistics and it matters yeah now the it... I'm glad that you brought up the the fact that Alien played a played a role in the the development, because mm-hmm. when I looked at the core mechanic of Change Stars, the it's there's a little bit of that Year Zero DNA in the in the fact that sixes are your friends. It's just that in this case you only need one, and mm-hmm. any sixes beyond that are tied into that twist system, which I'm guessing is your your guys's answer to the whole degrees of success thing in year zero which is kind of vague in a lot of cases yeah so dos i mean and i ada was a degree of success game itself i am i'm not unfond of them but it's a way to 
basically, when you do what we or Free League or other games who are in the ND circuit do, because you know you get around, you find people who love D6, you find people who hate D6 dice pools, and as a designer coming up around the time of Ada, I was not a lot of indie designer RPGs. I read a lot of small games. I still do sometimes on indie RPG Carousel which is coming back hopefully this Sunday, where I just know read through some game. It's a very positive feedback-oriented thing. I'm not being super critical. These are just people who are hobbyists. They're very small timers, and as designers, you know, attention can be oxygen, and sometimes you need that boost and someone to, like, look at it in good faith. So uh, that's the, where it chem- comes from, though, is you need to give people either huge dice pools or common rerolls. We went with common rerolls, and... If you give people common rerolls, well, now you're increasing the chance of a blowout success. And being told, oh, you got a lot of sixes, but it doesn't matter, that's not very good now, is it? No. So, or you could have that World of Darkness like situation where somebody gets a lot of hits, but then they have to roll damage, and even though they hit, the damage is absolute trash. Yeah. Linking attack and damage, which is done by another degree of, the degree of success games, and games akin to them, like Warhammer Fantasy 4th Edition, um, attempted to negate the damage roll entirely by tying it to the hit roll. And how, and it's base weapon damage plus degrees of success. Now, in practice, that was a lot faster on a VTT than it was at Tabletop, in my experience. But it, uh, it, it comes back to the idea of you want to put more oomph out and you don't want to necessarily be in the situation where like yeah um you definitely hit him but it didn't fucking matter and that can happen in change stars right like they can roll all their armor successes Mm -hmm. yada yada but at least you have something going at them and they have something going at you and you're thinking do i have a way to re-roll this or next time do i have a way to get a better modifier so it gives an ebb and flow and efficient push and pull to game design and God, I'm trying to think. I'm drawing a blank, but you know the Modifius 2D20 systems, I assume. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and there's some there's some ways to re-roll and influence that, and you're rolling for successes. And both of the dice are giving you successes, getting under this extra threshold is giving you a success. But in theory, you could get four, but in practice, you're, like, begging to get one. Mm-hmm. And... But there's always something to that extra success. Yeah. And... That brings me to the et- to the edge mechanic, and I know I know the term meta currency gets thrown around these days. I don't mm-hmm. use the term because I vi- because I don't like playing buzzword bingo. But there, a lot of games will have some sort of extra effort um, mechanic mm-hmm. or resource. World of Darkness obviously has willpower. D and D Fourth Edition had action points. Yes, I mm-hmm. yes I know I'm bringing in Fourth Edition. If you got a problem with that, pay me. <laughs> people, and I'm just saying that to the people listening. Um, mm-hmm. Eclipse Phase had Moxie. Um, the um, Warhammer Fantasy had had Fortune, and it seems that Edge uh, is the clo- the closest equivalent. Um, in, in, in terms of, I see what you're saying. Uh, technically speaking, it's more like ARPG's stress or the other escalatory mechanics that you would find in... Um, I'm trying to think. There's a game where you get, like... I don't want to say rage, but... The point is, you accrue... Um, you accrue it in exchange for rerolls, but like it's fucking you while you gain it. And you don't have to have any to spend it. Yeah, it's a risk reward send up. But unlike, I mean, Ada literally had Moxie as well, and that's just like, hey, you got a, you have a resource, spend the resource. In Change Stars, it's you don't have any edge. Gradually, there there is something like that for sense though. They get to spend processing in exactly what I just described. Mm-hmm. But for everybody else, you are pushing your luck, and you basically get to reroll everything that wasn't a failure. Or sorry, that wasn't a success. So you can keep your successes, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in exchange for rolling of the dice, but you also roll an edge dice. Your edge goes up, and edge dice care about rolling a one. If a single one is showing, you suffer a shock. If two ones are showing, you suffer a level two shock. Three or more, you get a three plus shock, and it usually puts you out of the scene, catatonic or worse. Mm-hmm. So, in sorry, that yeah. regard, in that regard, what you're describing, especially with that shock dice, mm-hmm. is a little bit reminiscent of the wild die. From all the way back in um, D6, from West End. Mm. 
the the D6 system that they used for say um the Star Wars games and such. Yeah. Yeah. Um, West End D6 is a pretty interesting um legacy of games because it felt like when you do game archaeology more or less it feels ubiquitous, but today so few people play them. But they influence so many of these D6 games. And there, there's still there's still some people using using that system for stuff that they put out since the system is open. A recent example would be the Zorro RPG. Oh wow, really? Yeah, and that came that came out a couple of years ago. Nice. Um, there and there's there's been a few there's been a few others since the the core the core D6 trilogy that came out in 2004. You can get PDFs of that for free now. Along with a bu- along with a bunch of other stuff that used that si- that used that system. Um, there, and I know I know one of the things that's that is al- that's also with. There's also the whole mythic D six that um. That cap- that um, Jerry Grayson had had done, which kind of spun into kind of spun into its own thing. And of course, of course, the micro version in the form of Mini Six, which is the D six system, but but re- really, really stripped down. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, the yeah, the the wild dice in terms of exploding dice, which reminds me of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Second Edition did all its damage that way. All damage is on D ten. Tens always exploded. Mm-hmm. Oh. If I have to use another recent example with D6, it would be um, Carbon Gray. I hear good things, but I haven't actually had a look at it. Oh, uh, if if you want if you want a if you want a, D, a good um, diesel punk affair, it's de- it's definitely up there. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, it in a roundabout way kind of reminds me of that same Uchronic diesel punk that say Degenesis or Tannhauser was trying to do. Hmm. Uh, That that's the best. It is adapted from a um, comic of the same name. I can't say too much on how well of an adaptation it does because I haven't read that comic. But point point is that there's pl- there's plenty of interesting stuff that's being do- that's being done with that setup. Oh, even, mm-hmm. there. I might be a little bit biased because treasure hunting seems to be kind of what kind of what I do. <laughs> On this cha- on this channel for the last decade, but one of the things that we had talked we had talked about before we went live is the fact that you ca- you kind of have a um you have a semi free form setup when it comes to character generation with the um at with the archetypes that you have which are essentially start essentially starting packages though there's nothing stopping someone from mix and matching with with the ones that are there. Yeah, they're uh, essentially just a list of how many focus stat, how many stat max increases am I getting, mm-hmm. how many skill bumps that let me violate the three cap at care gen am I getting, mm-hmm. and how many talents am I getting. And and to yeah. talents, the hmm? interesting thing I find about that is that you have that relatively or relatively more organized than say say more ubiquitous games as feats. <laughs> Yeah, there's. I actually wanted to make them a little more complicated, but I. So, to briefly survey this, sorry, I have a mouthful of food. I'll fix that real quick. <laughs> I was served a d- delicious piping hot meal by Pat. She's busy doing yet more art um, on our stock art packs and such. But what's up with the feats? The, the, sorry, no, the talents. And this is part of what I really like about the way that build diversity can work going right out the gate mm-hmm. is that. You only need to... The trees are more like a bush. You have the tier 1 and tier 2. That's it. They have a minimum of 3 in each. Some of them have 4 because I said fuck it and I I basically had to arrange it that way or knock off talents I wanted to keep. And you can, if you have one of the three types of archetype, and you can just shift that. It's not, it's not tied to a certain concept. You just decide you don't want the other boosts. Start the game with two talents. Your second talent can be tier two as long as you have the tier one. Because the only requirement is, have a tier one talent in this tree. And let you dig deeper on this. 
So one example would be the harmony tree, personal intimacy. When making a communicate test with a familiar individual, gain a plus two modifier. Tier two, peace counselor. Not to go too deep into the mechanics that the viewer hasn't heard of yet, but basically you get copes from psychological trauma, which are frequently brought around by either using your edge break, which we'll get to, or just um, your edge gets too high, you roll those three shock dice, ah, something bad happens, and has a long tail of its negative effects, right? Um, and it lets you help someone swap to a better cope that isn't causing them trouble. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, you, you can't get to that higher level without having the lower level, but you can start the game with any talent. There's no talent that you're not going to see until deeper into a campaign, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, the big, the big reason I ended up, I ended up liking what I saw with this is that they're that they're separated. Even if the tree is just a bush, um, they're separated into themes, so that if somebody has a certain idea of the type of archetype they'd like to fill, they know where to look. Like if exactly. They're... If they're building someone who's meant who's meant to be some sort of investigator, then say, here's the analytical tree. Done. Absolutely. And that's it gives you something to chew on. Maybe you do go like a, a short campaign or it jump starts with extra XP. Well, there's six talents. There, there's six talents in that tree, mm -hmm. right? So you can come back and get, oh, I, I passed up an investigator and tell the lie, but I can go back for it. And then there's the command tree, which is one of the trees that can fundamentally change how the game works because it lets you shift action economy to people and help have your communicate empathy-based tests help them on basically anything. Yeah. And then there's a Gunslinger, which is pretty self-evident, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can just sort of go at it. The mechanic tree, the medic tree, it goes on and on like this. Mm -hmm. oh. And this, the same sort of guidance applies to the gear packages because... A lot, a lot of games, even even the ones I lo even the ones I love, do fall into this trap of, here's one here's one hundred gold pieces, or here's fi here's five hundred new yen, or something like that, mm -hmm. and that then push you into the water and tell you to swim. Yeah, we um, shopping in Carrigen can really, we wanted to keep this Carrigen as fast as possible, but keeping it as open as possible. So, yeah, you get right in there, and depending on what you're allowed to pick from by your Dreamweaver, because sometimes you're going to be, like, a regular person living in a safe part of the Trinity, and you don't have, like, a firearm and battle armor, or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you have, you have uh, X many thousand, but these gear packages have pre-spent what would be your free spend. And free spend is still listed there. If you want a free spend, mm -hmm. you're free to. Yeah. But, and it, it, you don't lose out. Because, like, the civilian packages are free spend 3k. The blue collar is the very first one. You get the main rig, you get a bolt gun, a multi, and a com box, and you have 200 left over. If you chopped for it, there, there's no... I think in one version... In Ada, there was a, uh, more or less, a discount for your background goods. Uh, because it was, like, you're staying on theme or whatever. But here, I'm, I've just pre-collected, like, Bouncer... The dandy, the ruffian, the medic, the tech, the welder, all of these are just the spacer have all been put together for you, for your leisure, right? For your pleasure. So you can enjoy quickly because ideally, once you really know what you're doing, I mean, I have a player who said he, he did uh, another game recently with the High Road crew on Monday, but he's like, yeah, the last, as he was explaining to Kerrigan to these other three people who'd never played the game, the last two times I played this game, I finished my carriage while Lee was doing his intro spiel. Mm -hmm. Because if you know the game well enough, you are picking this shit, and you know what you want, you can pick this shit really fast. You can take a while, you know, take your time a la carte, really, if you've been given, like, a huge... You know, if you've been given, like, tens of thousands, now you can, like, shop for cyberware or something crazy, right? Technically speaking, actually, I realized there is one piece of cyberware you could have for 3.5k, and the non-civilian packages... The criminal and the restricted uh, are 4K free spend. So in theory, if you're willing to have only 500 otherwise, you could get the amp cyberware. That would be a Dreamweaver dependent if they wanted to let you start with that. But um, yeah, there's just all there's a lot of build freedom. But again, much like with archetypes, I'm trying to drive you forward. So if you want to be like, uh, if you want to be someone who has, uh the tools to repair things 
or a knife or drugs for healing people up or just have a nice outfit and a phone some cash on you mm-hmm. a scientist who's already got some some drugs and a chemical analyzer you just grab that you just look at it and be like oh, that seems seems all right to me and mm-hmm. you're done you don't need to use it it is an optional thing but it will help speed things up yeah now one of the, because of the fact that this is leaning into the umbrella that is space opera of course there's of course we're dealing with ships and oh yeah we're dealing with them with dealing with ships that com- that comes with it both ship customization and potentially ship combat hell and, yeah now with cu- with customizations i'm ass- i'm assuming that you're treating it as so- as something not far removed from a ship as its own character. I would certainly say that. Um, it depends. That, to an extent, would depend on how you run it, but literally, there is a shipboard AI installed. Mm-hmm. So, even even before we talked about the metaphor of ship as person, technically speaking, you've got either a person or a chatbot installed in your ship. And, well, the ship is alive motif has been, has been done plenty of times with science fiction. And I know some people would be tempted to bring up ED from, Ma- from Mass Effect. I'm going with a deeper cut for for my example in this. Yeah. Um, Farscape. Oh, nice. We have a we have a player who uh, an original player who swears by Farscape. I'll have to ask him for reference there. But the the idea of the ship being alive there. It very it very much is alive to the point where the pilot of the ship is symbiotically bound with it. Ooh. No one knows the name of the pilot. He's just called Pilot. <laughs> um, Farscape was an attempt by the Henson Company to show they could do more than just the Muppets, um, and <laughs> which is, which led to a few awkward moments early on when when um, one of the actors had to get a bit physical with one of the puppets, and he got he caught hell for it. Afterwards, he had said that the puppet made was um, had a bigger salary than he did. Um, um, um. <laughs> and yeah, the the same pe- the same people who did the animatronics for the for the Muppets for decades on end were responsible for the animatronics in um, Farscape because well, the Henson Company is the best in the business when it comes to that. Uh, and the shit. The ship is what is meant to ha- is meant to, aside from the fact that it's it's a, it's its own character like it is in a lot of space operas, um, it is semi it is semi alive. Um, it's on that border between whether it's tech or organic. Mm. Uh, that's the that's the best way for me to de- for me to describe it. It's a it's a tricky thing to summarize as. It is when you're dealing with things that are right on that um, no. threshold. Because I, I see what you're saying. There's there's a bit of a misconception that people seem to have when it comes to science fiction, and that is hyper focusing on the science, or as my friend has said, large men with screwdrivers. Yeah. What he me- what he meant by that is a lot of people have this idea of science fiction being technical people solving a technical problem. He partially blame Star Trek for that, but it but I don't think any one I think two thousand one is e- would is an even bigger culprit when it comes to that issue. And that kind of thinking of science fiction is relatively new when you contrast it with the, the totality of science fiction over the last century. Yeah, and we definitely have room for that. Mm-hmm. We'll get into it later I'm sure, but we have different frames. Only one of them is science team. And it's not that technical problems didn't arise for, say, a free merchant trying to keep their ship flying like it's Cowboy Bebop, right? Mm-hmm. you got to go do some hard emergency repairs. That comes up in space ship combat as well. But the ship, um, the ship, like, there's a, there's a pretty wide dichotomy here where, in, technically speaking, for all the small craft, we have one meter square maps. And, like, it's a, it's a, it's a map. It's a world you're inhabiting. It's the screen you're seeing. It has... Fairly simple but open customization in terms of hard points can accept either weapons or modules. Some of them will have something integral, like the Barracuda has a freight stacker, so you have like a, a space truck with a lot of cargo pods behind you. 
or uh, like the Mirai Miner has an integral salvaging arm and survey sensor, or you're the, some ships are built around huge guns. Mm -hmm. But we, we keep the stat blocks and the hard points pretty simple because they need to wind up in the complex scenario of, okay, now multiple of them are trying to kill each other and you're in one of them. And all the ramifications that happens in the crisis system. And organically inspiration, because while there's not like necessarily, the news guy have a coral-like substance they build their ships out of, but almost all of the non-human spaceships have an identifiable organic theme to them. And they're inspired by different creatures. And it speaks to the ideology and architecture of the people who created them. Yeah. Well, if you if in, if you want inspiration for weird ass creatures, just go to the bottom of the ocean. You'll get you'll get material for days. Exactly. And a lot of them, I mean the Barracuda, the Koi, the Piranha, the Raptor these uh human ships tend to be named after fish as like a motif for Pat. So But when it comes to dealing with conflicts on, on a ship, this is this is where things get tricky because some will resolve it almost in a war game like sense, and some will res and yeah. while that while that can certainly fit at times, it does it's it kind of takes away from the fantasy of the of the one ship that the party's sharing. Yeah, I studied. Um... Every spaceship rule I could find, every game with spaceship rules I could find, and was satisfied with none of them. Here are the basic problems that one might swiftly identify. Items, uh, players don't like the feeling that they're nobody, quote-unquote, on the map. And also, you're not probably easily able to map three-dimensional space. <laughs> There's different solutions you can take to that. Um, invest in a 4D chess space. <laughs> um... Yeah, in, invest in, uh, you know, stuff to actually do 3D. Or uh, do what Alien does and create relativistic jousting, where you have your speed and their speed, and you're both implicitly going at or away from each other, and you close the gap in that fashion. You can, uh, say, abstract it and say, space is big, man. Like... Space is everywhere, so you could be anywhere in space and just say it doesn't fucking matter. Um, and the lack of embodiment for characters. I mean, if you ever played with the Stars Without Number spaceship combat, it seemed cool in, in, in theory, but in practice, everybody says, I pass my turn to let someone else do something, or I make one skill check. Like, you're one part of a traditional AC, HPS, um, D D creature in Stars Without Number combat. Yeah. So, Change Stars goes for a 2D grid. For the space, but it also represents it, it shifts the focus largely within your own spaceship, and it is about moving around your ship, your ship getting blown to shit and having issues, trying to solve those issues. Some things can be done purely via action economy. Hey, uh, you can spend just a main action with no test to fix a fracture, which is something that will become damage if you take any more. Someone needs to go to the reactor and fix that, or in the reactor as well. Someone needs to reallocate our power. It's just a main action. Or you can do fast allocation as a systems test. So there's a lot of that. If you have skill, you can boost your impact. But if you don't, you can still do something. And that is part of keeping everyone engaged. Because if you built a face or a medic, what the fuck are you doing in space? Now, there's a few ways that that breaks down to our advantage and change stars. Because there's four stats. Three of them are related to something like, like systems. All the computery shit comes up a lot on in the space engagements. Uh, ballistics is under alacrity, operate is under alacrity, so flying and shooting comes up a lot. And mechanics under resilience comes up a lot for repairing it and for uh, manipulating certain mechanical aspects. And then empathy. Um, usually if you're a command builder, some other sort of a build, you'll be able to use it, but there's, it's, it's always possible that you have some sort of an empathy-based build, which is not necessarily going to be relevant in space combat, but you're still relevant because there's things you can do, there's places you can go, there's crises you can help resolve. So we wanted to keep everyone at the table involved, and we wanted to keep it going, and we didn't want it to be an entirely different game, which is something that a lot of these games are pretty guilty of, right? It's a whole different board game, it's a whole different war game, it's something unlike what you're playing otherwise. I think we really tried the line with our space engagements in terms of it is... Or it is the real deal. You are playing the same game. It's just there's like actions associated with rooms, and you're going between them, and you're facing problems. But it's all resolved 
and embodied the same way it would be normally. And because of that embodiment of the character on the map and the, their map movement mattering, and this can be abstracted, by the way, in most space engagements, you don't need to know what one meter square someone's in. It's like there's there's four boxes that are the primary components, one box for the hull and one box for the bridge. So it's like you're looking at like six boxes and saying, okay, um, you can only do this action in this box. You go there, and you're like, yeah, I do. And then it gets it with a rail gun, and there's a crisis, and everything's on fire, and yeah. But, you know, you, you chose to go there, and there's a feeling of agency and presence and embodiment that doesn't necessarily need to be perfectly mapped until you pop out of the 10-meter, sorry, the 10-minute turn time scale of spaceship combat for something like boarding or a major crisis that forces you guys to run around the terrain and deal with something weird going on, you know. And that is how the spaceship combat, as a natural bridge to the dramatic moment of conflict in space, without saying, fuck you, go make a different thing. My default answer to this problem, by the way, for any designers listening, is to just like make it a setting, kind of like Cowboy Bebop, where everyone just has the little strike vehicle, and you just go out for the mothership, right? Um, but the thing is, lore-wise, only the human empire was really willing to do that on a mass scale. And... Uh, it's set 100 years after the Human Empire fell, so most people aren't doing that, and most characters aren't suited to be pilots anyway. So dogfighting is the solution that I think is the, the easiest, but we couldn't use it. Yeah, for lower reasons. I can I could see I could see that, and as te as tempting as it would be to ha to have that, it isn't that it isn't that kind of it, it, one, it isn't that kind of setup, and two, even the, even the um, even the mo even the more experienced designers, which is kind which is kind of self defeating because you come you become an experienced designer next month. <laughs> yeah. Um, they even struggle with the concept. Yeah, I mean, I'm out to be. I, I have a lot of love for my fellow designers, and I've seen games people swear by, like uh, the old one of the really old. Because there have been several of them, but one of the really old games, Star Trek games, right? Um, I uh, I looked all over, and I did not find anything that suited my needs. Um, Especially since the kind of the kind of ship combat that something like, say, Star Trek would be would be trying to emphasize is the slow ass naval ba naval battle kind of thing and, and it's also like i mean bridge commander is fun right you're extreme like just power to shield is part of where power allocation comes from right it's a, it's a fun idea but yeah you're you're a bridge crew of staff officers ordering around a ship full of hundreds of people and that can happen and change stars but for the most part you guys like it's something it's a it's an environment where everyone's individual actions still matter and not just in a command sense or a technical officer sense, right? Like, there is a fire in life support. Someone needs to go pull a valve or use a fire extinguisher and do something. It is pretty immediate and scary. Yeah. Well, it could be worse. You could be. You could try and invoke the battle system that was in Starfleet Battles, which, mm. for a bit of reference, I'm going to send you an image of one of the um, ship sheets in that game. Look upon this and... Revel in horror. Oh, this is sexy as fuck. <laughs> See, left to my own designs, I would definitely make some shit like this. Meanwhile, I mean, if you check out the end of chapter four, you'll see. I mean, space, like, if you took an average note card and wrote down everything about your spaceship and changed stars, you'd have room to, like, doodle it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah but... So it's, it's, it's worlds apart, but... I have I have a softness in my heart for I, the, I had to keep ripping apart the system. I rewrote spaceships four times because they kept starting to look like that. They kept starting to look like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I've talked I've talked in the past about how back in like back in like the late '80s through a good chunk of the '90s, a lot of designers seemed to have this obsession with with um, unnecessary amounts of detail. It's an easy siren's call to succumb to, as you think. When is my game done? When I've made rules for all the things that come up, which especially is especially not. When it comes to don't think skill that well. Systems. Oh, yeah. 
the reason I when I covered the Alien RPG, I half jokingly s said this isn't the first time we we that we've gotten a alien that we've gotten alien in TTRPG form, but we don't talk about that other version back in the nineties. Oh yeah, I mean, I it, technically technically speaking, it's a board game, right? But like, it's weirdly detailed no, with a huge manual. No, that's a different like, thing. Oh, I because I, I, I remember seeing like all the different skills and items and shit from it once. There was a board game, which was, a, which was the equivalent of we have Space Hulk at home. But nice. there was the Aliens Adventure game, which yeah. was a mod which was using the rule set from Phoenix Command. Oh my God! <laughs> no way, Phoenix Command. Yes. God. Phoenix they, Command um... is on a short list of games that I have said I will not run unless I am paid. Not as a paid yeah. GM thing, but um, paid to co paid to cover psychological trauma. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do um, that. I've done my time we're, with we're, Phoenix Command. Roll a D1000 to find which precise centimeter of the alien's carapace you've struck and what effect it has. Just like 999 of like strikes upper left uh, mandibles left claw no effect. <laughs> Ricochet. <laughs> Yeah, that sort of hyper detailed kind of bullshit I've done my time with. I'm I'm not doing it again. No, yeah, I mean I see virtue in all manner of design and there's some people who will like swear by that shit. But then again, I did meet one person, she's very interesting. Um and I, and she was like, Oh, I play lots of vampire and I, like Vampire the Masquerade, yada yada and talking about like like, oh my favorite uh, is the Malkavians, yada yada and she's like I, at some point, I bring up the system. And she's like, "Oh, well, we never use the system. Um, we go and we learn the lore from these books, and then we play everything in GURPS. Everything. There's it, like, uh, and it was like the th crazy thing is, right? You meet people like that sometimes. But she was like, yeah, it's just the simplest for our group. And it was basically a five E. Well, we already know one system. Let's put it all in it thing. But to be fair, at least GURPS was built to be a generic role playing game that could handle anything, right? I'm not I'm not weighing in one way or the other whether or not it succeeds at that job, but I found it fascinating because it's, it's considered such a hard game to learn. But she was like, yeah, no, it's so easy. It's so much easier than um, all these other systems, and it's so straightforward and universal that we just apply it to everything. Says the person who's been using it for years on end and has had time to practice. Right, no, I mean, the thing is that, like, any game, right, like, you will eventually... I'm, I'm sure there's some group that's been playing Phoenix Command. It's like, oh, it's easy. I mean, that was me when I talked about um, damage calculation in ADA. Now... I did like a three-year run of an AP where we played Ada's rules in Fallout, and by the end, I was still scratching my head with some of the damage calculations. I, so I mean, um, it, it's easy to oh, it's easy to get in that situation. You know what I mean? The whole thing of it, the whole thing of oh, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. Mm -hmm. I I liken it to when I liken it to when you have you have you have dinner with you have dinner with somebody down south, and mm -hmm. what you're having like say. Fucking like gumbo or so or something, and mm -hmm. they're perfectly fine. You're you're sweating like a damn pig, and they're like, "What's the problem? It's not that hot." And meanwhile, they've yeah. been having spicy stuff for their whole damn life, and this is your first time having that level of heat. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely one of those situations. Where, yeah, to them, it's become so pedestrian routine. Mm -hmm. And and with. I will admit, GURPS is front is front loaded where the where the actual play is relatively easy, but I will admit that i I've, I've given I've given GURPS stands a, a fair amount of shit for the for the fact that when they say that you can use GURPS to run it to run everything, they end up ignoring the fine print, mm -hmm. which is the amount of work that you have to do in when you're dealing with a universalist system. There is a there is an extra bit of work on the GM to make sure things don't get out of hand. Absolutely, because it's ba you're basically having to balance everything and like decide what books you use, yada yada. Yeah, universalist games are are more akin to a programming language, and that that is a double edged sword. So you can't do anything, but are you going to enjoy the process? <laughs> yeah, and. It's it's all it's in the same vein that I don't I don't care for when people say, oh you can you can use any, you can run anything with this you just just um just house rule it like house ruling should be a spice not the main dish, and I don't know about you but I don't like drowning my steak in pepper. 
Yeah, it's definitely... I think that you can run anything in anything, you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure there's an official, uh, like, Hello Kitty or My Little Pony Adventure game system that I could take and use to run a, a xenomorph-infested spaceship. Like, I could, I could do it, but should I? Why am I? Why ought I not flex some design muscles and come up with something else? Or, better yet, play a dedicated game that has things for, say... You know, dedicated rules for things like the Xenomorph having acid splash blood. Mm -hmm. uh, shout out to that guy on the Effect podcast who came up with the mechanic. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of Wuxia, and mm -hmm. the idea of, I've, I've had, I've had people ask, would, it, would I ever use, say, D and D or Pathfinder to run a Wuxia style game, and I'm like. <laughs> Fuck uh, no. Yeah, it's like, are you going to have your thrice-refined golden liver really sing in a, the context of a game that's based on, you know, this war game from the 80s? No, it's not. It, there's so much more... There's so much that you can get in, like, a really specific genre, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh. There's there's also the... Fa there's also the... F one of the big problems you'd end up having with that is that whole martial... Ma magic divide that's in a lot of get a lot of games coming out of coming out of Europe or coming out of the Americas. Mm -hmm. um, you look at a you look at a lot of wuxia, that line doesn't exist. Throwing throwing around a fireball would just be seen as a different form of kung fu. Exactly. And Which is pretty cool. Yeah, it it is. It's it's one of the, it's one of those things you have to um work you have to work with the whole when in Rome do as the Romans do kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Oh. Now that be, that being that being said, um, you meant you mentioned doing a whole lot of rewrites when it came to change stars. Were were the, was there any situation where you had written yourself into a corner and you had to blow you had to um blow a certain part of the design up and start? Fresh? Oh yeah, three to four times on the spaceship rules. Even though I kept sort of going in the same direction, three or four times in the spaceship rules. And um, you used to spend stamina a lot. There's vestigial elements of the design where there's like one talent that lets you do that, and Veer can do that on melee attacks. But I additionally initially imagined like yeah, stamina is a health pool, but it's also a resource pool to spend, and that's almost entirely dead um, in the version of the game you're getting. It's, um, it's probably for the best because health and res simultaneous health and resource. That's that, <laughs> yeah, that was I something it. I ri I ripped a new one when it came to that um, Dark Souls RPG that Steamforge did because yeah. that, because they created a problem that didn't need to exist where they create they combined health and stamina into position, but you're still using it like stamina. Ooh, yeah, I, I don't know if you ever read the uh, Japanese Dark Souls game, but I hear it's really fucking good. Um, I know that. There, there is a translation in the works, but it's been half finished since May. Um, mm. From what I, from what I've seen, it's cer it's certainly interesting. And um, when you're when is you're it... dealing with Japanese tabletop, you ha you have to realize you you have to take a different approach. Um, yeah. I mean, you should you should do that anyways. You know, when in Rome, you do as the Romans do. But I could I could see that since the you talked about Siren's Call earlier. I think a common Siren's Call with any sort of science fiction or space opera is putting in as many ships as possible. Oh yeah, uh, which I mean, we did push for, and the chain and the um, the Kickstarter had the shipyards stretch goal. So in a sense, when we we're talking about things to cut, that was something that, like, from a word of honor perspective, right? Because mm -hmm. we didn't tell them how many we had and how many it would mean. We just said double. But if I'm going to do a stretch goal and say we'll double the number of ships, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to do the backers dirty and fail to double the number of ships. Mm -hmm. So, by that 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 was kind of like hand behind the back on that one. I I never wanted to cut any ships though anyway. I definitely think that the the question is does every ship have a unique role and a place because an, is a ship mostly something that you are in and maybe one other person, right? They're just as antagonist and protagonist, or are ships part of the world? Are they part of the workhorse and engine? You might never 
fight a space battle with a quarry, or you might, but you'll probably find one around working, or maybe you could board one that was derelict or parked somewhere, you know what I mean? So to us, like the plethora of ships are an advantage, not because we're pushing all of these and saying, and look, we have 20 different types of battleship. We don't. We have, frankly, I mean, I'm sometimes worried we have a paucity of battleships, right? But every ship is clear in its function, has a role, has a little data entry that tells you about what it's like and where it's from, and has something unique about it that sells it and explains its place in the world and the lore, and is something that you can see existing and maybe even being the basis for a whole adventure. Yeah. I will, I will note if I was running Change Stars and one of the encounters involves a battleship, if that battleship g gets blown up, it you are... Whoever... Whoever is GMing that is legally required to say the line. Say what line? You sunk my battleship. Oh. Yeah, that would, that would be pretty funny. Actually, speaking of, we actually have like five different fail states because as anybody who's played one of these games can tell you, and I think Quinn said on Quinn's Quest recently, like it feels like a false threat almost because the, D, the DM has to be willing to be like, all right, that's the campaign. You all just got cooked. You're all dead. In a situation where hitting zero means you're dead. But there's lots of ways to take out a, a ship and change stars because you're hitting these components, right? Like, the reactor's fully offline. Life support's totally gone. You've completely lost all, all propulsion. Your comp mesh is totally destroyed. Because what the fuck are you going to do now? You're, you're com you have a, a more or less a totally non-functional ship in some regard. You can chart and go and fix it, but odds are the enemy can board you before then, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can get an escape pod if they're trying to kill you, just straight up. Or if the if they're tr if they're trying to board, perfect. Um, turn off the lights and do an ambush. No, exactly. Which is sort of what I'm thinking of. Like, boarding is expected to be a huge element of the push and pull of the game. Um, and I mean, like a lot of these ship maps have vents on them, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, I say a lot. Um, some of them have vents on them. Yeah. And you can crawl around. You can get in these different rooms. You know your ship better than they do, probably. And you have all these different scenarios you can get into, features on your ship, uh, people boarding your ship, stowaways on your ship, you're boarding their ship, you're attacking their ship, yada yada, you're tethered to the ship and then it turns out that it's an ambush, and you're having a shootout across both of the ships, you're blowing up walls, you're depressurizing chambers, things are catching on fire, you're running out of oxygen. I mean, space is a, a constant danger and a dangerous place, and we definitely try and play that up with the rules. And to us, like the spaceship boarding is one of like the er examples. I mean, I'm working on a paid module, hopefully done sometimes tonight or tomorrow morning, called Hard Passage. And among other things, it involves like navigating a ship that's fucked, right? That's in some state of getting fucked up by an attacker. Mm -hmm. And all of the map changes that are added to that and the feeling of living in a confined world and things are going wrong in it. And now people are coming aboard and they're going to try and fucking kill you. Mm -hmm. but, so that's uh, all part of the joy and the fun to us. Yeah, it's, it sounds like the plans you have for the future of Change Stars is expanding using uh, modules. Is that right? Yeah. So we're intending the modules. We do eventually want to do expanded frames, which uh, are th concepts in the Dreamweaver's Guide for like the five sort of broad genre of campaign we see people probably playing in this universe right and the but the main push right now is modules modules that will probably give you like an encapsulated adventure there's two types there's advent right now um campaigns will come eventually there's adventure modules like the load which is pay what you want free to download on itch and drive through anybody who wants to right now if you're like, well, I don't want to pay, or well, you can look at the previews um, for the other stuff. But if you want to download a whole PDF, bearing in mind it's worse laid out than the main book is because the main book was done by a proper layout editor, Casey Chen, shout out Casey, um, whereas I did all the layout for the load. It still has past lovely art in it, but the layout is a little more basic, right? Um, if you just want to get a sense for, like, here's, a, here's an asteroid that your party could find them, their way into, to say more, to be spoilers, uh, that's available, and you can just get it. Uh, it's not you don't have to pay anything. Then there are scenario modules where you can insert the players in as any one of several roles, and it has a timeline of events 
and it has like a suggested time to instantiate events. But if you want to go way back to the beginning of like shit going down in Hard Passage and play from a side you'd expect to be, say, the antagonist, you can do that. And I've, I'm building scenario modules as very open-ended in that way as toolkits for the Dreamweaver while still giving a pretty clear baseline of like, okay, I bought a module, I want to run a module, get, get rid of all this hokey nonsense, what am I doing? And I, I have a list of default variables and I walk you through like, okay, just do this. It'll work exactly like an adventure module. Don't think about it too hard. Except you'll know a lot more about like down to the whatever time plan i mean like i've got plans drawn up like it's a football game for various different factions who you may be using right and what they would plan to do and what slot in that plan the pcs would take over from the npcs if you were to put them in it Mm -hmm. so those are the two types of module and then i want to do expanded campaign frames and then i wanted to do campaign modules but for right now it's adventure modules and scenario modules which are just adventure modules you can play from any of a variety of perspectives that i put in there yeah and i will i will certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how things develop going forward Mm -hmm. but with that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here of course and anytime you see fit to return the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged yay and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!